Mockingjay, Disc 4, Chapter 9 I stop trying to sleep after my first few attempts are interrupted by unspeakable nightmares. After that, I just lie still and do fake breathing whenever someone checks on me. In the morning, I'm released from the hospital and instructed to take it easy. Cressida asks me to record a few lines for a new Mockingjay propo. At lunch, I keep waiting for people to bring up Peter's appearance, but no one does. Someone must have seen it besides Finnick and me. I have training, but Gail's scheduled to work with Beatty on weapons or something, so I get permission to take Finnick to the woods. We wander around a while, and then ditch our communicators under a bush. When we're a safe distance away, we sit and discuss Peter's broadcast. I haven't heard one word about it. No one's told you anything? Finnick says. I shake my head. He pauses before he asks, Not even Gail? I'm clinging to a shred of hope that Gail honestly knows nothing about Peter's message, but I have a bad feeling he does. Maybe he's trying to find a time to tell you privately. Maybe, I say. We stay silent so long that a buck wanders into range. I take it down with an arrow. Finnick hauls it back to the fence. For dinner, there's minced venison in the stew. Gail walks me back to compartment E after we eat. When I ask him what's been going on, again there's no mention of Peta. As soon as my mother and sister are asleep, I slip the pearl from the drawer and spend a second sleepless night clutching it in my hand, replaying Peter's words in my head. Ask yourself, do you really trust the people you're working with? Do you really know what's going on? And if you don't, find out. Find out? What? From who? And how can Peter know anything except what the Capitol tells him? It's just a Capitol propo. More noise. But if Plutarch thinks it's just a Capitol line, why didn't he tell me about it? Why hasn't anyone let me or Finnick know? Under this debate lies the real source of my distress. Peter. What have they done to him? And what are they doing to him right now? Clearly Snow did not buy the story that Peter and I knew nothing about the rebellion, and his suspicions have been reinforced now that I have come out as the Mockingjay. Peter can only guess about the rebel tactics or make up things to tell his torturers. Lies, once discovered, would be severely punished. How abandoned by me he must feel. In his first interview, he tried to protect me from the capital and rebels alike, and not only have I failed to protect him, I've brought down more horrors upon him. Come morning, I stick my forearm in the wall and stare groggily at the day's schedule. Immediately after breakfast, I am slated for production. In the dining hall, as I down my hot grain and milk and mushy beets, I spot a communicuff on Gail's wrist. When did you get that back, soldier Hawthorne? I ask. Yesterday. They thought if I'm going to be in the field with you, it could be a backup system of communication, says Gail. No one has ever offered me a communicuff. I wonder if I asked for one, would I get it? Well, I guess one of us has to be accessible, I say with an edge to my voice. What's that mean? he says. Nothing, just repeating what you said, I tell him, and I totally agree that the accessible one should be you. I just hope I still have access to you as well. Our eyes lock, and I realize how furious I am with Gale. But I don't believe for a second that he didn't see Peter's propo, that I feel completely betrayed that he didn't tell me about it. We know each other too well for him not to read my mood and guess what has caused it. Katniss, he begins, already the admission of guilt is in his tone. I grab my tray cross to the deposit area, 
and slam the dishes onto the rack. By the time I'm in the hallway, he's caught up with me. Why didn't you say something? He asks, taking my arm. Why didn't I? I jerk my arm free. Why didn't you, Gail? And I did, by the way, when I asked you last night about what had been going on. I'm sorry, all right? I didn't know what to do. I wanted to tell you, but everyone was afraid that seeing Peter's papa would make you sick, he says. They were right. It did. But not quite as sick as you lying to me for coin. At that moment, his communicuff starts beeping. There she is. Better run. You have things to tell her. For a moment, real hurt registers on his face. Then cold anger replaces it. He turns on his heel and goes. Maybe I've been too spiteful, not given him enough time to explain. Maybe everyone is just trying to protect me by lying to me. I don't care. I'm sick of people lying to me for my own good. Because really, it's mostly for their own good. Lie to Katniss about the rebellion so she doesn't do anything crazy. Send her into the arena without a clue so we can fish her out. Don't tell her about Peter's propo because it might make her sick, and it's hard enough to get a decent performance out of her as it is. I do feel sick, heartsick, and too tired for a day of production. But I'm already at remake, so I go in. Today, I discover, we will be returning to District 12. Cressida wants to do unscripted interviews with Gail and me throwing light on our demolished city. If you're both up for that, says Cressida, looking closely at my face, Count me in, I say. I stand, uncommunicative and stiff, a mannequin, as my prep team dresses me, does my hair, and dabs makeup on my face. Not enough to show, only enough to take the edge off the circles under my sleepless eyes. Boggs escorts me down to the hangar, but we don't talk beyond a preliminary greeting, I'm grateful to be spared another exchange about my disobedience in eight, especially since his mask looks so uncomfortable. At the last moment, I remember to send a message to my mother about my leaving thirteen, and stress that it won't be dangerous. We board a hovercraft for the short ride to twelve, and I'm directed to a seat at a table where Plutarch, Gale, and Cressida are poring over a map Plutarch's brimming with satisfaction as he shows me the before and after effects of the first couple of propos. The rebels, who were barely maintaining a foothold in several districts, have rallied. They have actually taken three and eleven, the latter so crucial since it's Panem's main food supplier, and have made inroads in several other districts as well. Hopeful, very hopeful indeed says Plutarch. Fulvia's going to have the first round of We Remember spots ready tonight so we can target the individual districts with their dead. Then it's absolutely marvelous. It's painful to watch, actually, says Cressida. He knew so many of them personally. That's what makes it so effective, says Plutarch, straight from the heart. You're all doing beautifully. Coin could not be more pleased. Gail didn't tell them then, about my pretending not to see Peter and my anger at their cover-up. But I guess it's too little too late, because I still can't let it go. It doesn't matter. He's not speaking to me either. It's not until we land in the meadow that I realize Hamish isn't among our company. When I ask Plutarch about his absence, he shakes his head and says, He couldn't face it. Hamish? Not able to face something? Wanted a day off, more likely, I say. I think his actual words were, I couldn't face it without a bottle, says Plutarch. I roll my eyes, long out of patience with my mentor, his weakness for drink, and what he can or can't confront.
but about five minutes after my return to twelve, I'm wishing I had a bottle myself. I thought I'd come to terms with twelve's demise, heard of it, seen it from the air, and wandered through its ashes. So why does everything bring on a fresh pang of grief? Was I simply too out of it before to fully register the loss of my world? Or is it the look on Gale's face as he takes in the destruction on foot that makes the atrocity feel brand new? Cressida directs the team to start with me at my old house. I ask her what she wants me to do. Whatever you feel like, she says. Standing back in my kitchen, I don't feel like doing anything. In fact, I find myself focusing up at the sky, the only roof left, because too many memories are drowning me. After a while, Cressida says, That's fine, Katniss. Let's move on. Gale doesn't get off so easily at his old address. Cressida films him in silence for a few minutes, but just as he pulls the one remnant of his previous life from the ashes, a twisted metal poker, she starts to question him about his family, his job, life in the seam. She makes him go back to the night of the firebombing and reenact it, starting at his house, working his way down across the meadow and through the woods to the lake. I straggle behind the film crew and the bodyguards, feeling their presence to be a violation of my beloved woods. This is a private place, a sanctuary already corrupted by the capital's evil. Even after we've left behind the charred stumps near the fence, we're still tripping over decomposing bodies. Do we have to record it for everyone to see? By the time we reach the lake, Gale seems to have lost his ability to speak. Everyone's dripping in sweat, especially Castor and Pollux in their insect shells, and Cressida calls for a break. I scoop up handfuls of water from the lake, wishing I could dive in and surface alone and naked and unobserved. I wander around the perimeter for a while. When I come back around to the little concrete house beside the lake, I pause in the doorway and see Gale propping the crooked poker he salvaged against the wall by the hearth. For a moment I have an image of a lone stranger, somewhere far in the future, wandering lost in the wilderness and coming upon this small place of refuge, with the pile of split logs, the hearth, the poker, wondering how it came to be. Gale turns and meets my eyes, and I know he's thinking about our last meeting here, when we fought over whether or not to run away. If we had, would District 12 still be there? I think it would. But the capital would still be in control of Panem as well. Cheese sandwiches are passed around, and we eat them in the shade of the trees. I intentionally sit at the far edge of the group next to Pollux, so I don't have to talk. No one's talking much, really. In the relative quiet, the birds take back the woods. I nudge Pollux with my elbow and point out a small black bird with a crown. It hops to a new branch, momentarily opening its wings, showing off its white patches. Pollux gestures to my pin and raises his eyebrows questioningly. I nod, confirming it's a mocking jay. I hold up one finger to say, Wait, I'll show you, and whistle a bird call. The mocking jay cocks its head and whistles the call right back at me. Then, to my surprise, Pollux whistles a few notes of his own. The bird answers him immediately. Pollux's face breaks into an expression of delight and he has a series of melodic exchanges with the Mockingjay. My guess is it's the first conversation he's had in years. Music draws Mockingjays like blossoms do bees, and in a short while he's got half a dozen of them perched in the branches over our heads. 
He taps me on the arm and uses a twig to write a word in the dirt. Sing? Usually I'd decline, but it's kind of impossible to say no to Pollux, given the circumstances. Besides, the Mockingjay's song voices are different from their whistles, and I'd like him to hear them. So before I actually think about what I'm doing, I sing Rue's four notes, the ones she used to signal the end of the workday in Eleven, the notes that ended up as the background music to her murder. The birds don't know that. They pick up the simple phrase and bounce it back and forth between them in sweet harmony, just as they did in the Hunger Games before the mutations broke through the trees, chased us onto the cornucopia, and slowly gnawed Cato to a bloody pulp. Want to hear them do a real song? I burst out. Anything to stop those memories. I'm on my feet, moving back into the trees, resting my hand on the rough trunk of a maple where the birds perch. I have not sung The Hanging Tree out loud for ten years, because it's forbidden, but I remember every word. I begin softly, sweetly, as my father did. Are you, are you, coming to the tree where they strung up a man, they say murdered three? Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met up at midnight in the hanging tree. The mocking jays begin to alter their songs as they become aware of my new offering. Are you, are you, coming to the tree where the dead man called out for his love to flee? Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met up at midnight in the hanging tree. I have the bird's attention now. In one more verse, surely they will have captured the melody, as it's simple and repeats four times with little variation. Are you, are you, coming to the tree where I told you to run so we'd both be free? Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met up at midnight in the hanging tree. A hush in the trees, just the rustle of leaves in the breeze, but no birds, mocking jay or other. Peter's right, they do fall silent when I sing just as they did for my father. Are you, are you, coming to the tree, where our necklace of rope side by side with me? Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be, if we met up at midnight in the hanging tree. The birds are waiting for me to continue, but that's it, last verse. In the stillness I remember the scene, I was home from a day in the woods with my father, sitting on the floor with Prim, who was just a toddler, singing The Hanging Tree. Making us necklaces out of scraps of old rope, like it said in the song, not knowing the real meaning of the words. The tune was simple and easy to harmonize to, though, and back then I could memorize almost anything set to music after a round or two. Suddenly. My mother snatched the rope necklaces away and was yelling at my father. I started to cry because my mother never yelled, and then Prim was wailing and I ran outside to hide. As I had exactly one hiding spot, in the meadow under a honeysuckle bush, my father found me immediately. He calmed me down and told me everything was fine. Only we'd better not sing that song anymore. My mother just wanted me to forget it, so, of course, every word was immediately, irrevocably branded into my brain. We didn't sing it any more, my father and me, or even speak of it. After he died, it used to come back to me a lot. Being older, I began to understand the lyrics. At the beginning, it sounds like a guy is trying to get his girlfriend to secretly meet up with him at midnight. But it's an odd place for a tryst, a hanging tree, where a man was hung for murder. The murderer's lover 
must have had something to do with the killing, or maybe they were just going to punish her anyway, because his corpse called out for her to flee. That's weird, obviously, the talking corpse bit, but it's not until the third verse that the hanging tree begins to get unnerving. You realize the singer of the song is the dead murderer. He's still in the hanging tree, and even though he told his lover to flee, he keeps asking if she's coming to meet him. The phrase, where I told you to run so we'd both be free, is the most troubling, because at first you think he's talking about when he told her to flee, presumably to safety. But then you wonder if he meant for her to run to him, to death. In the final stanza, it's clear that that's what he's waiting for. His lover, with her rope necklace, hanging dead next to him in the tree. I used to think the murderer was the creepiest guy imaginable. Now, with a couple of trips to the Hunger Games under my belt, I decide not to judge him without knowing more details. Maybe his lover was already sentenced to death and he was trying to make it easier to let her know he'd be waiting, or maybe he thought the place he was leaving her was really worse than death. Didn't I want to kill Peter with that syringe to save him from the capital? Was that really my only option? Probably not, but I couldn't think of another at the time. I guess my mother thought the whole thing was too twisted for a seven-year-old, though, especially one who made her own rope necklaces. It wasn't like hanging was something that only happened in a story. Plenty of people were executed that way in twelve. You can bet she didn't want me singing it in front of my music class. She probably wouldn't like me doing it here for Pollux, even. But at least I'm not. Wait. No, I'm wrong. As I glance sideways, I see Castor has been taping me. Everyone is watching me intently and Pollux has tears running down his cheeks because no doubt my freaky song has dredged up some terrible incident in his life. Great, I sigh and lean back against the trunk. That's when the Mockingjays begin their rendition of the hanging tree. In their mouths, it's quite beautiful. Conscious of being filmed, I stand quietly until I hear Cressida call Cut! Plutarch crosses to me, laughing. Where do you come up with this stuff? No one would believe it if we made it up. He throws an arm around me and kisses me on the top of my head with a loud smack. You're golden! I wasn't doing it for the cameras, I say. Lucky they were on, then, he says. Come on, everybody! Back to town. As we trudge back through the woods, we reach a boulder, and both Gail and I turn our heads in the same direction, like a pair of dogs catching a scent on the wind. Cressida notices and asks what lies that way. We admit, without acknowledging each other, it's our old hunting rendezvous place. She wants to see it, even after we tell her it's nothing, really. Nothing but a place where I was happy, I think. Our rock ledge overlooking the valley, perhaps a little less green than usual, but the blackberry bushes hang heavy with fruit. Here began countless days of hunting, and snaring, fishing, and gathering, roaming together through the woods, unloading our thoughts while we filled our game bags. This was the doorway to both sustenance and sanity, and we were each other's key. There's no District 12 to escape from now, no peacekeepers to trick, no hungry mouths to feed. The capital took away all of that, and I'm on the verge of losing Gale as well. The glue of mutual need that bonded us so tightly together for all those years is melting away. Dark patches, not light, show in the spaces between us. How can it be that today, in the face of Twelve's horrible demise, 
We are too angry to even speak to each other? Gail as good as lied to me. That was unacceptable, even if he was concerned about my well-being. His apology seemed genuine, though, and I threw it back in his face with an insult to make sure it stung. What is happening to us? Why are we always at odds now? It's all a muddle. But I somehow feel that if I went back to the root of our troubles, my actions would be at the heart of it. Do I really want to drive him away? My fingers encircle a blackberry and pluck it from its stem. I roll it gently between my thumb and forefinger. Suddenly I turn to him and toss it in his direction. And may the odds, I say, I throw it high so he has plenty of time to decide whether to knock it aside or accept it. Gail's eyes train on me, not the berry. But at the last moment, he opens his mouth and catches it. He chews, swallows, and there's a long pause before he says, Be ever in your favor. But he does say it. Cressida has us sit in a nook in the rocks, where it's impossible not to be touching, and coaxes us into talking about hunting. What drove us out into the woods, how we met, favorite moments. We saw, begin to laugh a little, as we relate mishaps with bees and wild dogs and skunks. When the conversation turns to how it felt to translate our skill with weapons to the bombing in eight, I stop talking. Gail just says, Long overdue. By the time we reach the town square, afternoons sinking into evening, I take Cressida to the rubble of the bakery and ask her to film something. The only emotion I can muster is exhaustion. Peter, this is your home. None of your family has been heard of since the bombing. Twelve is gone, and you're calling for a ceasefire? I look across the emptiness. There's no one left to hear you. As we stand before the lump of metal that was the gallows, Cressida asks if either of us has ever been tortured. In answer, Gale pulls off his shirt and turns his back to the camera. I stare at the lash marks and again hear the whistling of the whip, see his bloody figure hanging unconscious by his wrists. I'm done, I announce. I'll meet you at the victor's village. Something for my mother. I guess I walked here, but the next thing I'm conscious of is sitting on the floor in front of the kitchen cabinets of our house in the victor's village meticulously lining ceramic jars and glass bottles into a box, placing clean cotton bandages between them to prevent breaking, wrapping bunches of dried flowers. Suddenly I remember the rose on my dresser. Was it real? If so, is it still up there? I have to resist the temptation to check. If it's there, it will only frighten me all over again, I hurry with my packing. When the cabinet's empty, I rise to find that Gale has materialized in my kitchen. It's disturbing how soundlessly he can appear. He's leaning on the table, his fingers spread wide against the wood grain. I set the box between us. Remember, he asks, this is where you kissed me. So the heavy dose of morphling administered after the whipping wasn't enough to erase that from his consciousness. I didn't think you'd remember that, I say. Have to be dead to forget. Maybe not even then, he tells me. Maybe I'll be like that man in the hanging tree, still waiting for an answer. Gail, who I have never seen cry, has tears in his eyes. To keep them from spilling over, I reach forward and press my lips against his. We taste of heat, ashes, and misery. 
It's a surprising flavor for such a gentle kiss. He pulls away first and gives me a wry smile. I knew you'd kiss me. How? I say, because I didn't know myself. Because I'm in pain, he says. That's the only way I get your attention. He picks up the box. Don't worry, Katniss. It'll pass. He leaves before I can answer. I'm too weary to work through his latest charge. I spend the short ride back to Thirteen curled up in a seat, trying to ignore Plutarch going on about one of his favorite subjects, weapons mankind no longer has at its disposal. High-flying planes, military satellites, cell disintegrators, drones, biological weapons with expiration dates, brought down by the destruction of the atmosphere or lack of technological resources or moral squeamishness. You can hear the regret of a head game maker who can only dream of such toys, who must make do with hovercraft and land-to-land -land missiles and plain old guns. After dropping off my Mockingjay suit, I go straight to bed without eating. Even so, Prim has to shake me to get me up in the morning. After breakfast, I ignore my schedule and take a nap in the supply closet. When I come to, crawling out from between the boxes of chalk and pencils, it's dinner time again. I get an extra large portion of pea soup and am headed back to compartment E when Boggs intercepts me. There's a meeting in command. Disregard your current schedule, he says. Done, I say. Did you follow it at all today? he asks in exasperation. Who knows? I'm mentally disoriented. I hold up my wrist to show my medical bracelet and realize it's gone. See? I can't even remember they took my bracelet. Why do they want me in command? Did I miss something? I think Cressida wants to show you the twelve propos, but I guess you'll see them when they air, he says. That's what I need a schedule of, when the propos air, I say. He shoots me a look, but doesn't comment further. People have crowded into command, but they've saved me a seat between Finnick and Plutarch. The screens are already up on the table, showing the regular capital feed. What's going on? Aren't we seeing the twelve propos? I ask. Oh, no, says Plutarch. I mean, possibly, I don't know exactly what footage Beatty plans to use. Beatty thinks he's found a way to break into the feed nationwide, says Finnick, so that our propos will air in the capital, too. He's down working on it in special defense now. There's live programming tonight. Snow's making an appearance or something. I think it's starting. The capital seal appears, underscored by the anthem. Then I'm staring directly into President Snow's snake eyes as he greets the nation. He seems barricaded behind his podium, but the white rose on his lapel is in full view. The camera pulls back to include Peter off to one side in front of a projective map of Panem. He's sitting in an elevated chair, his shoes supported by a metal rung. The foot of his prosthetic leg taps out a strange, irregular beat. Beads of sweat have broken through the layer of powder on his upper lip and forehead. But it's the look in his eyes, angry yet unfocused, that frightens me the most. He's worse, I whisper. Phoenix grasps my hand to give me an anchor, and I try to hang on. Peter begins to speak in a frustrated tone about the need for the ceasefire. He highlights the damage done to key infrastructure in various districts, and as he speaks, parts of the map light up, showing images of the destruction, a broken dam in seven, 
a derailed train with a pool of toxic waste spilling from the tank cars, a granary collapsing after a fire. All of these he attributes to rebel action. Bam! Without warning, I'm suddenly on television, standing in the rubble of the bakery. Plutarch jumps to his feet. He did it! Beachy broke in! The room's buzzing with reaction when Peter's back, distracted. He has seen me on the monitor. He tries to pick up his speech by moving on to the bombing of a water purification plant when a clip of Finnick talking about Rue replaces him. And then the whole thing breaks down into a broadcast battle as the capital tech masters try to fend off Beatty's attack. But they are unprepared and Beatty, apparently anticipating he would not hold on to control, has an arsenal of five to ten second clips to work with. We watch the official presentation deteriorate as it's peppered with choice shots from the propos. Plutarch's in spasms of delight, and most everybody is cheering Beatty on, but Finnick remains still and speechless beside me. I meet Hamish's eyes from across the room, and see my own dread mirrored back. The recognition that with every cheer, Peter slips even farther from our grasp. The capital seals back up, accompanied by a flat audio tone. This lasts about 20 seconds before Snow and Peter return. The set is in turmoil. We're hearing frantic exchanges from their booth, Snow plows forward, saying that clearly the rebels are now attempting to disrupt the dissemination of information they find incriminating. But both truth and justice will reign. The full broadcast will resume when security has been reinstated. He asks Peter if, given tonight's demonstration, he has any parting thoughts for Katniss Everdeen. At the mention of my name, Peter's face contorts in effort Katniss, how do you think this will end? What will be left? No one is safe, not in the capital, not in the districts. And you, in 13. He inhales sharply, as if fighting for air. His eyes look insane. Dead by morning. Off camera, Snow orders. End it. Beatty throws the whole thing into chaos by flashing a still shot of me standing in front of the hospital at three second intervals. But between the images, we are privy to the real life action being played out on the set. Peter's attempt to continue speaking, the camera knocked down to record the white tiled floor, the scuffle of boots, the impact of the blow that's inseparable from Peter's cry of pain and his blood as it splatters the tiles. Part 2. The Assault Chapter 10 The scream begins in my lower back and works its way up through my body only to jam in my throat. I'm an AVOX mute, choking on my grief. Even if I could release the muscles in my neck, let the sound tear into space, would anyone notice it? The room's in an uproar. Questions and demands ring out as they try to decipher Peter's words. And you, in thirteen, Dead by morning. Yet no one is asking about the messenger whose blood has been replaced by static. A voice calls the others to attention. Shut up! Every pair of eyes falls on Hamish. It's not some big mystery. The boy's telling us we're about to be attacked. Here, in 13. How would he have that information? Why should we trust him? How do you know? Hamish gives a growl of frustration. They're beating him bloody while we speak. What more do you need? Katniss, 
Help me out here. I have to give myself a shake to free my words. Hamish is right. I don't know where Peter got the information or if it's true, but he believes it is, and there... I can't say aloud what Snow's doing to him. You don't know him, Hamish says to Coyne. We do. Get your people ready. The president doesn't seem alarmed, only somewhat perplexed by this turn in events. She mulls over the words, tapping one finger lightly on the rim of the control board in front of her. When she speaks, she addresses Hamish in an even voice. Of course, we have prepared for such a scenario. Although we have decades of support for the assumption that further direct attacks on 13 would be counterproductive to the capital's cause, nuclear missiles would release radiation into the atmosphere with incalculable environmental results. Even routine bombing could badly damage our military compound, which we know they hope to regain. And of course, they invite a counterstrike. It is conceivable that, given our current alliance with the rebels, those would be viewed as acceptable risks. You think so, says Hamish. It's a shade too sincere, but the subtleties of irony are often wasted in 13. I do, at any rate. We're overdue for a level 5 security drill, says Coyne. Let's proceed with the lockdown. She begins to type rapidly on her keyboard, authorizing her decision. The moment she raises her head, it begins. There have been two low-level drills since I arrived in 13. I don't remember much about the first. I was in intensive care in the hospital, and I think the patients were exempted, as the complications of removing us for a practice drill outweighed the benefits. I was vaguely aware of a mechanical voice instructing people to congregate in yellow zones. During the second, a level two drill meant for minor crises, such as a temporary quarantine while citizens were tested for contagion during a flu outbreak, we were supposed to return to our living quarters. I stayed behind a pipe in the laundry room, ignored the pulsating beeps coming over the audio system, and watched a spider construct a web. Neither experience has prepared me for the wordless, eardrum-piercing, fear-inducing sirens that now permeate 13. There would be no disregarding this sound, which seems designed to throw the whole population into a frenzy. But this is 13, and that doesn't happen. Boggs guides Finnick and me out of command, along the hall to a doorway, and onto a wide stairway. Streams of people are converging to form a river that flows only downward. No one shrieks or tries to push ahead. Even the children don't resist. We descend, flight after flight, speechless, because no word could be heard above this sound. I look for my mother in Prim, but it's impossible to see anyone but those immediately around me. They're both working in the hospital tonight, though, so there's no way they can miss the drill. My ears pop and my eyes feel heavy. We are coal mine deep. The only plus is that the farther we retreat into the earth, the less shrill the sirens become. It's as if they were meant to physically drive us away from the surface, which I suppose they are. Groups of people begin to peel off into marked doorways, and still Boggs directs me downward, until finally the stairs end, at the edge of an enormous cavern. I start to walk straight in, and Boggs stops me, shows me that I must wave my schedule in front of a scanner, so that I'm accounted for. No doubt the information's going to some computer somewhere to make sure no one's gone astray. The place seems unable to decide if it's natural or man-made. Certain areas of the walls are stone, while steel beams and concrete heavily reinforce others. Sleeping bunks, 
are hewn right into the rock walls. There's a kitchen, bathrooms, a first aid station. This place was designed for an extended stay. White signs with letters or numbers are placed at intervals around the cavern. As Boggs tells Finnick and me to report to the area that matches our assigned quarters, in my case E for compartment E, Plutarch strolls up. Ah, here you are, he says. Recent events have had little effect on Plutarch's mood. He still has a happy glow from Beatty's success on the airtime assault, eyes on the forest, not on the trees, not on Peter's punishment or Thirteen's imminent blasting. Katniss, obviously this is a bad moment for you. What with Peter's setback, but you need to be aware that others will be watching you. What? I say. I can't believe he actually just downgraded Peter's dire circumstances to a setback. The other people in the bunker, they'll be taking their cue on how to react from you. If you're calm and brave, others will try to be as well. If you panic, it could spread like wildfire, explains Plutarch. I just stare at him. Fire is catching, so to speak, he continues, as if I'm being slow on the uptake. Why don't I just pretend I'm on camera, Plutarch? I say. Yes, perfect. One is always much braver with an audience, he says. Look at the courage Peter just displayed. It's all I can do not to slap him. I've got to get back to coin before lockdown. You keep up the good work, he says, and then heads off. I cross to the big letter E posted on the wall. Our space consists of a 12 by 12 foot square of stone floor delineated by painted lines. Carved into the wall are two bunks. One of us will be sleeping on the floor and a ground level cube space for storage. A piece of white paper coated in clear plastic reads bunker protocol. I stare fixedly at the little black specks on the sheet. For a while they're obscured by the residual blood droplets that I can't seem to wipe from my vision. Slowly the words come into focus. The first section is entitled On Arrival. 1. Make sure all members of your compartment are accounted for. My mother and Prim haven't arrived, but I was one of the first people to reach the bunker. Both of them are probably helping to relocate hospital patients. 2. Go to the supply station and secure one pack for each member of your compartment. Ready your living area. Return pack or packs. I scan the cavern until I locate the supply station. A deep room set off by a counter. People wait behind it, but there's not a lot of activity there yet. I walk over, give our compartment letter, and request three packs. A man checks the sheet, pulls the specified packs from shelving, and swings them up onto the counter. After sliding one on my back and getting a grip on the other two with my hands, I turn to find a group rapidly forming behind me. Excuse me, I say as I carry my supplies through the others. Is it a matter of timing, or is Plutarch right? Are these people modeling their behavior on mine? Back at our space, I open one of the packs to find a thin mattress, bedding, two sets of gray clothing, a toothbrush, a comb, and a flashlight. On examining the contents of the other packs, I find the only discernible difference is that they contain both gray and white outfits. The latter will be for my mother and Prim, in case they have medical duties. After I make up the beds, store the clothes, and return the backpacks, I've got nothing to do but observe the last rule. 3. Await further instructions. I sit cross-legged on the floor to await, 
A steady flow of people begins to fill the room, claiming spaces, collecting supplies. It won't take long until the place is full up. I wonder if my mother and Prim are going to stay the night at wherever the hospital patients have been taken. But no, I don't think so. They were on the list here. I'm starting to get anxious when my mother appears. I look behind her into a sea of strangers. Where's Prim? I ask. Isn't she here? She replies. She was supposed to come straight down from the hospital. She left ten minutes before I did. Where is she? Where could she have gone? I squeeze my lids shut tight for a moment to track her as I would prey on a hunt. See her react to the sirens, rush to help the patients, nod as they gesture for her to descend to the bunker, and then hesitate with her on the stairs. Torn for a moment, but why? My eyes fly open. The cat! She went back for him! Oh, no! My mother says. We both know I'm right. We're pushing against the incoming tide, trying to get out of the bunker. Up ahead, I can see them preparing to shut the thick metal doors, slowly rotating the metal wheels on either side inward. Somehow I know that once they have been sealed, nothing in the world will convince the soldiers to open them. Perhaps it will even be beyond their control. I'm indiscriminately shoving people aside as I shout for them to wait. The space between the doors shrinks to a yard, a foot. There are only a few inches left when I jam my hand through the crack. Open it! Let me out! I cry. Consternation shows on the soldiers' faces as they reverse the wheels a bit, not enough to let me pass, but enough to avoid crushing my fingers. I take the opportunity to wedge my shoulder into the opening. Prim! I holler up the stairs. My mother pleads with the guards as I try to wriggle my way out. Prim! Then I hear it, the faint sound of footsteps on the stairs. We're coming! I hear my sister call. Hold the door! That was Gail. They're coming! I tell the guards, and they slide the doors open about a foot. But I don't dare move, afraid they'll lock us all out, until Prim appears, her cheeks flushed with running, hauling Buttercup. I pull her inside, and Gail follows, twisting an armload of baggage sideways to get it into the bunker. The doors are closed with a loud and final clank. What were you thinking? I give Prim an angry shake and then hug her, squashing Buttercup between us. Prim's explanation is already on her lips. I couldn't leave him behind, Katniss, not twice. You should have seen him pacing the room and howling. He'd come back to protect us. Okay, okay. I take a few breaths to calm myself, step back and lift Buttercup by the scruff of the neck. I should have drowned you when I had the chance. His ears flatten, and he raises a paw. I hiss before he gets a chance, which seems to annoy him a little, since he considers hissing his own personal sound of contempt. In retaliation, he gives a helpless kitten mew that brings my sister immediately to his defense. Oh, Katniss, don't tease him, she says, folding him back in her arms. He's already so upset. The idea that I've wounded the brute's tiny cat feelings just invites further taunting. But Prim's genuinely distressed for him. So instead, I visualize Buttercup's fur lining a pair of gloves, an image that has helped me deal with him over the years. Okay, sorry. We're under the big E on the wall. Better get him settled in before he loses it. Prim hurries off, and I find myself face to face with Gail. He's holding the box of medical supplies from our kitchen in twelve. Sight of our last conversation. Kiss, fallout, whatever. My game bags slung across his shoulder. If Peter's right, 
These didn't stand a chance, he says. Peter, blood like raindrops on the window, like wet mud on boots. Thanks for everything. I take our stuff. What were you doing up in our rooms? Just double-checking, he says. We're in 47 if you need me. Practically everyone withdrew to their spaces when the doors shut, so I get to cross to our new home with at least 500 people watching me. I try to appear extra calm, to make up for my frantic crashing through the crowd, like that's fooling anyone, so much for setting an example. Oh, who cares? They all think I'm nuts anyway. One man, who I think I knocked to the floor, catches my eye and rubs his elbow resentfully. I almost hiss at him, too. Prim has Buttercup installed on the lower bunk, draped in a blanket so that only his face pokes out. This is how he likes to be when there's thunder, the one thing that actually frightens him. My mother puts her box carefully in the cube. I crouch my back supported by the wall, to check what Gale managed to rescue in my hunting bag. The plant book, the hunting jacket, my parents' wedding photo, and the personal contents of my drawer. My Mockingjay pin now lives with Sinna's outfit, but there's the gold locket and the silver parachute with the spile, and Peter's pearl. I nodded in the corner of the parachute, bury it deep in the recesses of the bag, as if it's Peter's life and no one can take it away as long as I guard it. The faint sound of the sirens cut off sharply. Coyne's voice comes over the district audio system, thanking us all for an exemplary evacuation of the upper levels. She stresses that this is not a drill, as Peter Mellark, the District 12 victor, has possibly made a televised reference to an attack on 13 tonight. That's when the first bomb hits. There's an initial sense of impact, followed by an explosion that resonates in my innermost parts. The lining of my intestines, the marrow of my bones, the roots of my teeth. We're all going to die, I think. My eyes turn upward, expecting to see giant cracks race across the ceiling, massive chunks of stone raining down on us. But the bunker itself gives only a slight shudder. The lights go out, and I experience the disorientation of total darkness, speechless human sounds, spontaneous shrieks, ragged breaths, baby whimpers, one musical bit of insane laughter dance around in the charged air. Then there's a hum of a generator, and a dim wavering glow replaces the stark lighting that is the norm in 13. It's closer to what we had in our homes in 12, when the candles and fire burned low on a winter's night. I reach for Prim in the twilight, clamp my hand on her leg, and pull myself over to her. Her voice remains steady as she croons to Buttercup. It's all right, baby. It's all right. We'll be okay down here. My mother wraps her arms around us. I allow myself to feel young for a moment and rest my head on her shoulder. That was nothing like the bombs in eight, I say. Probably a bunker missile, says Prim, keeping her voice soothing for the cat's sake. We learned about them during the orientation for new citizens. They're designed to penetrate deep in the ground before they go off, because there's no point in bombing 13 on the surface anymore. Nuclear? I ask, feeling a chill run through me. Not necessarily, says Prim. Some just have a lot of explosives in them, but it could be either kind, I guess. The gloom makes it hard to see the heavy metal doors at the end of the bunker. Would they be any protection against a nuclear attack? 
and even if they were 100% effective at sealing out the radiation, which is really unlikely, would we ever be able to leave this place? The thought of spending whatever remains of my life in this stone vault horrifies me. I want to run madly for the door and demand to be released into whatever lies above. It's pointless. They would never let me out. And I might start some kind of stampede. We're so far down. I'm sure we're safe, says my mother wanly. Is she thinking of my father's being blown to nothingness in the mines? It was a close call, though. Thank goodness Peter had the wherewithal to warn us. The wherewithal. A general term that somehow includes everything that was needed for him to sound the alarm. The knowledge, the opportunity, the courage. And something else I can't define. Peter seems to have been waging a sort of battle in his mind, fighting to get the message out. Why? The ease with which he manipulates words is his greatest talent. Was his difficulty a result of his torture? Something more? Like madness? Coyne's voice, perhaps a shade grimmer, fills the bunker, the volume level flickering with the lights. Apparently, Peter Mallark's information was sound, and we owe him a great debt of gratitude. Sensors indicate the first missile was not nuclear, but very powerful. We expect more will follow. For the duration of the attack, citizens are to stay in their assigned areas unless otherwise notified. A soldier alerts my mother that she's needed in the first aid station. She's reluctant to leave us, even though she'll only be 30 yards away. We'll be fine, really, I tell her. Do you think anything could get past him? I point to Buttercup who gives me such a half-hearted hiss, we all have to laugh a little. Even I feel sorry for him. After my mother goes, I suggest, Why don't you climb in with him, Prim? I know, it's silly, but I'm afraid the bunk might collapse on us during the attack, she says. If the bunks collapse, the whole bunker will have given way and buried us but I decide this kind of logic won't actually be helpful. Instead, I clean out the storage cube and make Buttercup a bed inside. Then I pull a mattress in front of it for me and my sister to share. We're given clearance in small groups to use the bathroom and brush our teeth, although showering has been cancelled for the day. I curl up with Prim on the mattress double layering the blankets because the cavern emits a dank chill. Buttercup, miserable even with Prim's constant attention, huddles in the cube and exhales cat breath in my face. Despite the disagreeable conditions, I'm glad to have time with my sister. My extreme preoccupation since I came here, no, since the first games, really, has left little attention for her. I haven't been watching over her the way I should, the way I used to. After all, it was Gail who checked our compartment, not me. Something to make up for. I realize I've never even bothered to ask her about how she's handling the shock of coming here. So how are you liking Thirteen, Prim? I offer. Right now? She asks. We both laugh. I miss home badly sometimes, but then I remember there's nothing left to miss anymore. I feel safer here. We don't have to worry about you. Well, not the same way. She pauses, and then a shy smile crosses her lips. I think they're going to train me to be a doctor. It's the first I've heard of it. Well, of course they are. They'd be stupid not to. They've been watching me when I help out in the hospital. I'm already taking the medic courses. It's just beginner stuff. I know a lot of it from home. Still, there's plenty to learn, she tells me. 
That's great, I say. Prim, a doctor. She couldn't even dream of it in twelve. Something small and quiet, like a match being struck, lights up the gloom inside me. This is the sort of future a rebellion could bring. What about you, Katniss? How are you managing? Her fingertip moves in short, gentle strokes between Buttercup's eyes. And don't say you're fine. It's true. Whatever the opposite of fine is, that's what I am. So I go ahead and tell her about PETA, his deterioration on screen, and how I think they must be killing him at this very moment. Buttercup has to rely on himself for a while, because now Prim turns her attention to me, pulling me closer, brushing the hair back behind my ears with her fingers. I stopped talking, because there's really nothing left to say, and there's this piercing sort of pain where my heart is. Maybe I'm even having a heart attack, but it doesn't seem worth mentioning. Katniss, I don't think President Snow will kill PETA she says. Of course she says this. It's what she thinks will calm me. But her next words come as a surprise. If he does, he won't have anyone left you want. He won't have any way to hurt you. Suddenly I am reminded of another girl, one who had seen all the evil the capital had to offer. Joanna Mason, the tribute from District 7 in the last arena. I was trying to prevent her from going into the jungle where the Jabberjays mimicked the voices of loved ones being tortured. But she brushed me off, saying, They can't hurt me. I'm not like the rest of you. There's no one left I love. Then I know Prim is right that Snow cannot afford to waste Peter's life, especially now, while the Mockingjay causes so much havoc. He's killed Sinna already, destroyed my home, my family, Gale, and even Hamish are out of his reach. Peter's all he has left. So what do you think they'll do to him? I ask. Prim sounds about a thousand years old when she speaks. Whatever it takes to break you.